debt deal that almost wasn't. After Speaker John Boehner, a man broken by the ceaseless and absurd demands of the raucous caucus, after he bucked his own party and joined Democrats to pass a clean debt limit extension, yesterday it fell to the traditionally somewhat more reasonable Senate to send the bill to the president's desk. But no sooner had the House passed the bill than Texas Senator Ted Cruz, the high priest of self-promotion, threatened to filibuster it. That completely self-serving decision then forced Republican senators to join Democrats to ensure passage of what should be the routine task of extending the nation's borrowing authority. Even a political mastermind like Ted Cruz could not have predicted the chaos that would ensue. A nearly hour-long scramble on the Senate floor during which Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell tried to find some, any Republican willing to make sure that the United States of America did not default on its credit. But as the minutes ticked by, crickets from the leaders of the grand old party. Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, the senators who always post bail for the unreformed members of the right, they were reportedly miffed that they have long been asked to take tough votes when the GOP leaders voted no. Knowing what he had to do, Mitch McConnell began his march to the gallows to cast his vote in support of something that every single member of Congress secretly supports. Right before he did so, McConnell reportedly told his colleagues, we're not doing this again. In the end, it was McConnell and Texas Senator John Cornyn, both men facing Tea Party challengers this fall, who were forced to take the plunge. Ten more Republican senators, including Senator McCain, Murkowski, and Collins, would ultimately join them. Here is how Republican Senator Bob Corker, who voted with McConnell and Cornyn, here's how Senator Corker described the madness in the upper chamber. There was no game plan. I asked before we went out to vote, okay, uh, we block cloture, we put the country in economic turmoil, we create uh, tr tremendous distress for the next several weeks. What is the end game? And there was no end game. Ground control to the Republican Party. Is there anybody who knows how to fly this plane? Joining me now is the Washington Bureau Chief for BuzzFeed, John Stanton, and Washington Post columnist and senior fellow of governance studies at the Brookings Institute, the wonderful E.J. Dion. Uh, E.J., I, I want to start with you first. Carl Hulse has a really interesting analysis in the New York Times today where he talks about the vote no, hope yes caucus and, and notes this kind of unprecedented and outrageous time, uh, this moment that's happening in the Republican Party, and says the following, I'll quote him, the implications for governing are obvious. If many lawmakers are unwilling or refuse to vote for legislation that they understand to be necessary and even beneficial, out of fear of retribution from an empowered and outspoken wing of their party, reaching agreement on major policy like immigration becomes difficult, if not impossible. I tended to agree with that, although I feel like your column today, which we'll talk about in a second, is a little bit more bullish about our prospects uh, for the governing body that is Congress. I try to be bullish, but I thought that that, uh, that uh, Carl's New York Times piece was excellent. And it's uh, uh, there are there are always times when politicians have a position on one or two issues where they vote no, but they really hope yes. Republicans in the House are in a position where most of the time they have to have that position, and that doesn't work. You've got about a quarter of the House caucus, 60 or so, uh, who really would rather disrupt governing than govern. But then you've got a whole lot of others who don't really feel that way, but are petrified of having a Tea Party primary, of having these big groups like Heritage Action attack them. And and so they have to pretend that they feel that way. And so on the debt ceiling, everybody knew that had to go through. Uh, but in the end, only 28 Republicans were willing to vote for it. Uh, that New York Times piece says that's the smallest number in the majority that ever passed a major piece of legislation uh, with the minority party. And people have messed around with the debt ceiling before. But back in the olden days, everybody knew it had to pass, and they always figured out how to do it in advance. Since 2010, when the Republicans took over, they were using it to hold the nation's credit hostage to demands, and that ended this week, and that is a very good thing. John, you know, as EJ points out, it was um, the lowest percentage for a majority on passage since the House began publishing electronic data 
on votes in 1991. You also reported on the, a, a strange and weird and disturbing thing that has been happening in the House, which is that House Republicans have received anonymous email threats to their personal email addresses about a possible yes vote on the debt ceiling. This, this whole vote has been cloaked in so much threatening behavior and malice. It's fairly shocking. How scared did you sense members were about this vote in advance of it? And, and how real was this email threat? I, I, I don't know that the email threat ultimately played much of a role, frankly, in a lot of their, their votes. I mean, it was very much like that sort of odd email that you get from the uncle that is into conspiracy theories, frankly. Um, but they, their biggest concern was that it seemed to be coming from either somebody inside of the House uh, itself or someone in the House was helping some outside person to, to do this. And I think that that points to the, to the broader problem that, that has been going on with this conference, which is that the, you know everything is sort of broken down at this point. There's no longer sort of a decorum. There's no longer a respect for the internal rules. And you know these kind of votes now become a thing where they say, as long as I don't have to vote for it, uh, I'm good. You can do whatever you want. I just don't want to be seen voting for it. This is, this is I can't be associated with it. And that is the overriding um, uh, reality and, the, and sort of the drive now. It's a very much just sort of a survival drive for most of the Republican conference, I think. Why, why did you, I mean, John, I want to ask you, since you're on the Hill, uh, why, why did Murkowski and Collins, why did these senators hang back and make Cornyn and McConnell do this, knowing the, the backlash that they would get, the fact that it could upset, I mean, well, or it could just throw into question potential Republican take back of the Senate. Why would they do that? Well, you know, it's, it, it, it's interesting to watch this, actually, because normally, you're right, they do sort of all step out and, and, and vote for something. And in this case, some of them held back. John McCain went back into the cloakroom, apparently, and was trying very hard to get some of his colleagues to come out. And I do think that there is this growing frustration within the, the moderate part, part of the Republican Party, or, you know, at least the not sort of, let's constantly have warfare with Democrats part of the party, <laughs> that they feel like they are being put into this bad position sort of nonstop. It's a bit like what happened with frankly with uh, uh, Democrats and people like uh, Olympia Snow and Susan Collins at the beginning of the Obama administration when they felt like Harry Reid was taking advantage of them and their the willingness to work with Democrats and they sort of backed away and were unwilling to do anything and then we sort of went into Obamacare and they became much more adversarial. You're now starting to see that kind of a dynamic with their own leadership, which also, again, points to the fact that things are just not going very well within the Republican conference right now, I think. Yeah, you know, if we talk about mounting frustration, EJ, uh, Robert Costa, in a great piece of reporting, says that when Boehner announced what he was going to do to his own, pe you know, to his own people, which was to say, this fairly procedural thing that's become so fraught, when he announced he was going to do, go for a clean debt limit passage, um, Costa writes that on his way to his seat, Boehner shook his head, then turned to the nearly mute crowd and wondered aloud why he wasn't getting applause, and then said, I'm getting this monkey off your back and you're not even going to clap. Now granted, that is behind closed doors, but in context of John Boehner expressing publicly his outrage at heritage action and outside groups that have really scuttled action in his house. Do you think he's finally reached the tipping point, EJ? Well, my favorite moment in Congress in a long time was that news conference where John Boehner walked out singing zippity doo da, right. zippity a, my oh my, what a wonderful day. Uh, and, you know, it should have sort of showed the nice dark humor side of John Boehner. Um, he is clearly sick of this. And, you know, he went on, uh, I guess it was Jay Leno, uh, where he basically just let all his frustration out at his uh, people. And it's that frustration which gives me a little bit of hope on immigration reform. Uh, you know, one of the things I wrote about today is I think it would be a good idea to start a um, discharge petition because Boehner has made clear to lots of people he'd actually like to pass immigration reform um, and maybe he could welcome, uh, he would welcome a little bit of pressure on the other side uh, to uh, make it possible to pass this. But I think he's a very frustrated guy. He's almost John Boehner unplugged right now <laughs> as maybe they can do a recording of him on <laughs> uh, uh, with zippity doo <laughs> The unplugged versions of the song are always better anyway. We have to leave it there. BuzzFeed's John Stanton and the Washington Post's E.J. Dion, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.